Good morning. It's good to see you this weekend. I want to welcome the Mobile campus, Malvis campus, everybody online with us today. Thanks for being part of our weekend experience. And uh, I know you're loving the weather. It's cold, then it's rainy, and then it's full of humidity. So welcome to South Alabama. Uh, but thanks for being with us this weekend. A couple things I want to share with you before I get into the message. Uh, if you have not been part of Heart for the Kingdom yet, making that commitment, it's not too late. I'm asking every family to pray and ask the Lord what he would have you do to help us next year to finish four initiatives that we have going on. There's a card in front of you in the back of the seat. You can take that and look at that, pull the card off, fill it out. But I want you to pray and ask the Lord what he'd have you do, and that's between you and the Lord. So if you haven't done that, I encourage you to do that. Also, you'll remember a couple of weeks ago that we, in that message, we had rocks, and you put a name on a rock that you know of a loved one or a friend that you want to see come to the Lord. At the Malvis campus, where we're building a new worship facility, we're going to take those stones from the Mobile campus and the Malvis campus, and we're going to put those stones in the footings. We'll be pouring some footings next week, and so this is the last weekend for you to have that opportunity to fill out a name and put it in the basket, and we'll, we'll have, you'll see that next week. We'll show you some of that on video. So I want to remind you to do that. Also, just uh, FYI, so that you know we have not forgotten it, we're still waiting on assessments from our friends and colleagues in the Philippines that we work with there. Uh, the organization there that has, uh, it's called Samaritan's Place. It's connected with, an, it's an orphanage, and it's connected with the government's agency, RSCC, and they are looking and strategizing and making assessments of the hard-hit areas of where the orphans went after the typhoon. So we will be part of that. We'll be supporting them, and we'll let you know and keep you up to date on what comes up in the next few weeks on that. Just wanted to let you know that. If you have your Bibles or your devices, uh, you can turn to Genesis 45 and then to Romans chapter 12. Uh, this is the last message in the Joseph series. We've been talking about how God has give, had given Joseph a dream when he was 17. God had a destiny in mind for him, but he had to go through certain tests to develop character in his life because character is what supports our destiny. If you missed any of these, you can go online and watch them in their entirety, and soon the series will be out on DVD, and you can pick that up. So uh, this weekend is the last me message. We're going to talk about the purpose test. How can we know God's purpose? What is his purpose for our lives? And how do we fulfill that purpose? Now, last weekend, remember we talked about Joseph's father, Jacob, had died. The brothers uh, made up a message from their deceased father, brought the message to Joseph. This week, we're going to back up a little more chronologically. We're going to go back to Genesis 45. And this is in this text, the reason I need to go here, and, and I mentioned a little of it last week, is this is the first time Joseph sees his brothers since they have sold him uh, into slavery. He's 39 years old. He was 17 then. And he has been the ruler of uh, the, the prime minister of Egypt now for about nine years. They've had the seven good years, and now they've had two years of famine. His brothers show up to Egypt, and they're trying to buy grain to stay alive. Verse 3, then Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. They thought he was dead. Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I'm Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to reserve life. For these years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Joseph finally releases that God had his purpose. This is Joseph's purpose. He releases the purpose God has for him. The question is, how can you know and discover your purpose? So I have four points in the message. Here's the first one. First, you have to believe you have a purpose. The number one question deep in the hearts of most individuals is, what is my purpose? Why am I here? D does God even have a purpose for me, or am I just a number? Understand that God is a purposeful God. He is not a purposeless God. 
everything he created has a purpose. Ecclesiastes 3.1. We remember the first part of this verse. We forget the last part. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. I told you last weekend, you have a time. There's an assignment of time. So, when you look at everything God created, it has a purpose. Now, I have trying to qualify that when I look at cats. I'm not real sure, but if God did it, I guess there's a reason. But anyway, uh, the best way to discover your purpose, and if you're a cat lover, it's okay, you know. Uh, maybe that was for you, the cat, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the best way to discover your purpose is to look at how God made you. How did God made you? make you? Well, here's what Jeremiah said, chapter 1, verse 5. He said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. In the Hebrew, the word knew means designated and appointed. So before I formed you in the womb, God said, I, I have designated and appointed you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. Sanctified means you're set apart with a special purpose. I ordained you. Ordained means made you ready for your destiny. So when you came from the womb, you entered the world. You arrive according to God's blueprint. There's a diagram that's created and known before God, before the foundation of the world. So you have a design for destiny. The designer has a specific purpose in mind when he designed you. So you need to figure out, watch what you look like in the spirit. You know what you look like in the natural. And many of you don't look in the mirror very long, but you, you, you know what you look like in the natural. But do you know what you look like in the spiritual? I'm going to help you with that today. So first, you have to believe you have a purpose. Secondly, you have to understand God is in control. To fulfill, your, to fulfill your purpose, you may go through difficulties. You may go through setbacks. And people may say things to you and do things that are wrong or rumors or lies. But understand, God has a purpose for your life, and he's in control. If you notice in the text we read, Joseph said three times, God sent me, God sent me. And it wasn't you guys, my brothers, but God sent me. That's a great attitude because here's Joseph. First they're going to kill him. Then, they're gonna, then they sell him as a slave. Then he's wrongly accused by Potiphar's wife, so he ends up in prison. But he understands the whole time God is in control and God has a plan. In other words, no one can derail you from your destiny but you. If people say something, if they do something, you can get over it. Or if people cause some offense and the enemy uses that offense, we talked about it last weekend, to stop the offense is to stop you from believing that you can fulfill your purpose. You have to remember what the scripture says. Isaiah said in 55 and 11, so shall my word that goes forth from my mouth. This is God talking. So shall my word that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Here's what God's saying. When I speak, my word will never return without accomplishing the purpose for which I sent it. Now, here's the question. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe it? Do you believe what Paul said in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in me will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ? See, the good news is God has spoken over you. He has a purpose for your life. And, and if you'll allow these character traits to be developed, you'll fulfill your purpose. The other good news is this, that if you fail the test, you can retake it and retake it and retake it because God wants you to get into your destiny. If you believe God is in control of your life, listen, you're an optimist. And that's really the difference between an optimist and a pessimist. An optimist believes God's in control uh, and, and he's going to turn the situation around. The pessimist is always looking for the bad side, experiencing the wor expecting the worst to happen. So one, believe you have a purpose. Two, understand God's in control. Here's number three, discover your gift. Now watch. If you're going to fulfill the destiny God has on your life, find out what your gift is. God has given you a gift. In Romans 12, where I want you to turn, I'm going to show you a list of what Bible scholars call the motivational gifts. These gifts, they motivate you. They are natural to you. Okay, there are seven of them. You have at least one. They're in you. It's the way you look at life. It's the way you roll. It's the way you operate. You have at least one of these. As I read this text, I will identify all seven. Okay, then I'll come back and tell you what they mean. Verse four, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them, 
Here's the first one. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Number two, ministry, let us use it in our ministering. Number three, he who teaches in teaching. Number four, he who exhorts in exhortation. Number five, he who gives with liberality. Number six, he who leads with diligence. And number seven, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, those are the seven gifts. I'm going to give the names that describe the function of those gifts. So here, here's they are. Watch. See if you find yourself here yet. The first one is prophecy. Here's what that means. Not the office of a prophet, but the gift of prophecy. Here's what it means. It's a motivator. It, you're a motivator. You're a person. If you're, you have a gift of prophecy, you're a motivator. You desire to motivate people to serve God, love God. That, that's what drives you. You're always motivating other people. You're positive. You're encouraging them to serve God. Ministry, the second one, that's a Greek word that means serving. So the real word is servant. A servant desires to meet the needs of people. They just can't help it. it, it, it this could be you. You, you finish the meal in a restaurant and you're sitting at the table talking and that's it's the one person who goes ahead and they're cleaning the plates and stacking the plates and getting everything all arranged for everybody and they just can't help it. They have to serve. Number three is the teacher. These are the ones who they teach. They desire to study. They're reading more than one book at a time. They have a Bible software program and, 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 and they love to study all kind of stuff. They love to send me emails like, Pastor, I know you're busy, but just one quick theological question. Could you explain the book of Revelation to me? I can't because I don't understand it either. <laughs> the exhorter, this is an encourager. Now, th this is my wife, okay? She's an encourager. These people desire to admonish and encourage people. They love to encourage you no matter what. I can throw out any negative situation. She's going to find something to be encouraged with. It makes me so angry sometimes because I can't get angry about something because she's going to find the good in it. I mean, and encouragers like this, you say, I lost my job, and they'll say, God's got a better one. You say, my house burnt down, and say, they'll say, well, it was old. You needed a new one. <laughs> They're encouraging constantly. Number five, gives. That's a giver. This is the person who desires to meet the needs of people on a financial basis. They love to help people financially, but they're not going to help somebody who won't work hard and live by biblical principles because they know if you don't do those two things, you'll end up right back where you were. It's called the cycle of poverty. And, and they don't mind giving money, but they give wisdom and counsel also. Number six, leads. That's an administrator. We thank God for this gift. They, they desire to lead people through organization. They're, they're organized leaders, and they, and they you have to have people like this, and they're a wonderful gift. Number seven, mercy. That's a sympathizer. That's a person who a, de desires to identify and sympathize with people. So you need mercy people. You need encouragers around you when you're going through difficulties. So how can you really see these gifts in a practical way? Well, if you've been in church very long, you, you will see these gifts and how they operate. Let, let's just say you, you served on a team in a church. You notice I didn't use the C word, uh, committee. Uh, that's a bad word. But team. You served on a team in a church. And, and so on that team, you have a leader. That's the administrator. And he's leading the meeting and he passes out the agenda because he's very organized and you can't just play it by ear. You have to go by the agenda and you can't just skip around. So he's leading the meeting and with the agenda and he brings up a situation in the meeting under point number whatever. And he says, so-and-so in our church lost his job. As soon as he says that, the, the people in this on this team, the, the, the gifts are brought to action. Why? Here's what I want you to see. All the definitions that I just gave you are all about people. Your gift has to do with serving and helping people. No matter what gift you have, it has to do with people. And as soon as a person's brought up in this team meeting, the gifts go into action. And here's the prophet. The prophet says, well, maybe they have sin in their life. We ought to talk to them about it because once they get the sin out, th then that will help them. The teacher says, yeah, but if they'll go and, and do, the first, do the five steps in 1 Timothy 3, then, then they can get another job because there's steps in the Bible how to get another job. The encourager, he's already texting the guy and say, hey, man, we're praying for you. We got your back. The giver says, hey, let's take an offering. I'll give the first $100. The servant has already left the meeting and, and has already gone to buy groceries for the guy and is calling somebody else to go cut his grass and clean his house and the mercy person's over in the corner of the room praying and crying. That's how the gifts operate. Notice Joseph's gift is leadership. Now stay with me. And his gift worked everywhere he was in life. He didn't wait until he got into a place of authority to lead. He administered in Potiphar's house. 
He had ministered in the prison. And so there he was in the pit. Look, when he's in the pit, I say it was probably the most organized pit you could find. I think he cleaned it out, got rid of the rocks, he took the sticks and made a little bed, and it was so organized because that was his gift. So I I, I want you to see this. Here's what people say. They say, well, when I get a position, then I'll minister in my gift. No, the way you get the position is minister in your gift. You, You start wherever you are. You start now in your gift, and then that's what opens the door for you. I know some of you have had setbacks like Joseph and difficulties, but please keep being faithful, ministering in your gift because that's what opens the door. What opened the door for Joseph to get out of prison? He interpreted the dreams of the butler and the baker. You you understand if he had been so consumed with all of his problems and his woes, he didn't have time to minister to someone else. So no matter what you're going through, be conscious of people around you, minister to them, and your ministry now will cause you to step into your purpose. So watch where I'm going. One, believe that you have a purpose. Number two, understand God's in control. Three, discover your gift. And here's number four, determine your direction and be faithful. You may be wondering, well, pastor, I want to know the specifics of my purpose. Am I supposed to have this job or that job, this occupation or this position or that? What are the specifics of my purpose? Or maybe you would say, well, can I know the specifics of my purpose? Yes, you can. Well, then how how, how can I know? When, When can I know the specifics of my purpose? After you do them. See, you begin faithfully moving in the direction of your gift one step at a time. The Bible says that the Word of God is a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. It doesn't say it's a cue beam showing you the whole highway. It's one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time. You faithfully take the next step. Be faithful in what God has called you to do. All of a sudden, you'll find yourself affecting lives wherever you go because you simply step out and begin moving in the gift God's called you to do. I can't tell you your specific purpose, and I'm not sure God will tell you all the specifics because I think we may mess it up. Joseph's gift is leadership. When you start leading, and he started leading, and he was faithful right where he was, in the pit from the prison all all the way up, he's going to have great influence, and he saved the life, really, of the whole world. He saved the lives of the whole world with what happened. Now, if you'd be honest... You probably asked the question, but how do I stay faithful when I keep failing test after test? I'm glad you asked that question. The prophet Jeremiah has the answer. Really, it's from God. In Jeremiah 29 and 11, here's what God says. For I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God said, I know. Now, you may not know. I may not know. God says, I know. How does the creator think of stuff he already knows? God said, I know the thoughts. The original word for thought in the Hebrew means to interpenetrate, weave, or plait together. God says, hey, I have to tell you this because you can't figure it out. My ways are not your ways, and, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. So take my word for it. I think thoughts about you, every one of you, and my thoughts are a picture of elements that are braided and woven together, and they're different textures and different colors, and they're woven and braided together, interpenetrating one another. And yes, there are things in your life that look lifeless, and they look dead and non-productive, but when I attach my life to it, I create a masterpiece. I weave together the dead stuff by the power of my life. I breathe life into it so it will bring glory to me. I don't know if you've ever seen a handmade rug that was woven by an artist. But if you see the backside of the rug first, you would say, that's an ugly rug. You have to see the other side to see the masterpiece. That's exactly what the enemy wants us to do is focus on the wrong side of what God is doing in our life. He wants you to look at the negative, the dead, the ugly side to say, there is no purpose in my life. I want you to say this statement with me, okay? I want you to say this. God's not finished with me. He's still weaving me into his purpose. See, here's what God's doing. 
He's weaving together the elements and the articles that seem totally different to us, but God wants you to know. He knows, but he wants us to know that the downtime, the slow time, the discouraging time, the mistaken times, the dry times, the dead times, when I weave them together with my thoughts, they give you an expected end. It, watch. Here's God's goal for you, the end. The end. God said, I think thoughts toward you, and the thoughts that I think are thoughts to give you a hope and a future. Hope and a future put together is an expected in. The word in in the Hebrew, the picture word translates future. So God's goal is to give you a future. However, the root word for the word in speaks of that which is backwards. So in speaks of that which is coming, future. The root word speaks of moving backwards. Therefore, the root implies of moving into it backwards. God is saying that your des my destiny for you is to give you an end, a future, a picture of moving into the future, but you're moving in with a backward focus. Watch. Jewish scholars say that this word in is, is like a picture of a man living in a rowboat. A rowboat is their picture of future. God says, when I weave together the elements of your life and I see your life as one living and moving into your destiny, it's as life is being lived in a rowboat. God says, hey, I see your life. My eyes are on you. I'm thinking about you. I see your life as a man moving into a destiny as life lived in a rowboat. But here's what we do in, in our world today. See, if you're living your life as if you're in a motorboat, which didn't exist when this was written, uh, then your hands are on the controls. And then you control the direction and the speed of that boat. And if you're living life as, in, as if in a motorboat, you're facing and you're guiding the boat into where you want to go, which becomes your destination. But if you're in a rowboat, you don't face your destination. In a rowboat, you face where you've come from, and you're rowing into your future. And God says, your life and the future I have for you is like a person who's moving forward, but moving forward, facing and focusing backwards. God says, I'm moving you in a such a way that, that he never wants you to forget how far he's brought you. He never wants you to forget what he's done for you. He never wants you to forget how he's kept you and protected you. And when you realize what he has already done, it sets you up for what he's getting ready to do. Because, watch, anybody can thank him for what he's already done, but God is looking for people with enough faith to go ahead and thank him for what he's getting ready to do. And you may not understand this statement, but I'm going to make it, and I'm making it by faith. In other words, what's coming is better than what has been. With God's, per God is in control. He's in control. And what is coming is better than what's been. So God, here's what God's saying. I'm weaving your life together, the good times, the bad times, the dry times, the up times, the down times, the sunny times, the rainy times. I'm weaving them together into your destiny, but I'm doing it as if you're in a rowboat. You're moving forward, and you're always aware of where I have brought you from. And the scripture said God's preparing us for that purpose. He has a plan for you, not for evil. That means no not for calamity. God's purpose is not for calamity, but it's for hope and a future, which means an expected end. And here's the American question. How long does it take? How long does it take? I, I, right now, I need it right now. Tell me right now. I, you've been into the pizza places, right? The real ones where they, where they, they roll it out and they, and they beat it out and they spin it and all of that. And, you, and you know, they, they go through a lot of work in spinning and smashing that dough, right? Because, see, once it's flattened and put in the fire, it's ready to receive the good stuff. You know, the, the, the cheese and, 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 and the sauce and the, and, and the peppers and the onions and the pepperoni and, and you, you're getting you hungry, right? And so, uh, you know, so see, you can't get the good stuff until the dough is ready to receive it. God will take ever how long it takes to prepare you for the good stuff. See, everybody wants the good stuff right now, but the good stuff has to be resting on something that's prepared to receive it. Okay then what do I do while I'm waiting on the good stuff? I'm glad you asked that question because Jeremiah tells us in verse 12, 
Watch what God says. While you're waiting on the good stuff, while you're flattened out and you're waiting on everything to be heated up and ready to receive it, he says, then you call on me and you go and pray to me and I'll listen to you. And then you will seek me and you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. All your heart. Five times he says, it's about me. Just focus on me. Turn to me. God is saying, even though we don't have the specifics of the plan, it's not completely unfolded to us, but make a persistent pursuit of me. And, and, and let me tell you why this is a good verse, because there's so much confusion today with people understanding their purpose, especially the younger generation. What is my purpose? Why am I here? See, God said, I know the thoughts I think toward you, and it's thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. See, the word peace is not the absence of adversity. It's the presence of assistance. And here's what it means, that even whatever the enemy of your dreams throws at you, whatever dart, whatever arrow the enemy of your dreams shoots at you, you have the seed of God inside of you, and it will lead you to fulfill your dreams. But you have to pursue it. And see, here's what people do. They want to give up on their God-given dreams. And this message is to do this. This message is to give you a little encouragement. It's to give you a little push in your rowboat. So you'll take hold of the oars and faithfully trust him and rest in his peace. I mean, you, you know what you do in a rowboat, right? Row. <laughs> row, row, row your boat. Jump. See, you, you jump right in there. You, two oars for two hands. If you just use one hand and one oar, you go in circles. What's the representation of the oars? What's the representation? But the oars represent the word and worship. Here's your part. Your part is to stay in his word and to worship him. Your part is to stay in his word, connect to his word and his promises that he has a plan for you, and to worship him, make him first in your life. He'll move you into your purpose, and you will see your destiny fulfilled. I'm telling you, it's the way God does it. Let, let me give you an example in the natural a man named John Wesley lived in the 1700s. He and his brother Charles, are, 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 they founded the Methodist movement. But it started when John, when he took, an, when he took open air in, in ministries. And, and, and here's some entries I want to read out of his personal diary just from a month. I want to show you some little things that he put in there and, and as, from son, as preaching in different churches. So here's this man who's a godly man. And, and I want you to listen and see if you could get discouraged with this. Sunday morning, May the 5th, I, I preached in St. Anne's. I was asked not to come back anymore. Sunday night, May 5th, I preached at St. John's. Deacon said, get out and stay out. Sunday morning, May the 12th, I preached at St. Jude's. Can't go back there either. Sunday morning, the 19th, I preached at St. Somebody Else's. Deacons called a special meeting, said I couldn't return. Sunday night, May the 19th, preached on the street corner. I got kicked off the street corner. Sunday morning, May the 26th, preached in the meadow, chased out of the meadow because the bulls turned loose during the service. Sunday morning, June the 2nd, I preached at the edge of town, kicked off the highway at the edge of town. Sunday night, June the 2nd, I preached in a pasture. And 10,000 people came to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because of that man's persistence in his dream, God used him and his brother to just change our world. We're, we're benefits of that. Listen, God has a specific purpose for your life. Find out what your gift is. Be faithful and don't allow setbacks to hinder you in any way. Just, just continue walking in the gifting God has given you and you will find yourself in the destiny God has for you. Listen, when I was 45 years old, the Lord impressed me to become a pastor. I was a children and youth pastor for 20 years, but for most people that didn't count. But God was pressing me to pastor, start a church, plant a church, and I did. And here's what I wrestled with. And I had to wrestle with this for the first couple of years. I said, God, why didn't I do this when I was 22? Why didn't I do this when I was 25? Why did I wait until I'm 45 to do this? I have wasted all that time. And here are two things. Here's what God said to me. He said, everything that you've done, every experience you've been through, none of that is wasted. It's all preparation for what you're going to do now. You, you, you haven't wasted any time. It's, it's all part of the process. 
You, you see, we, we want to limit things to our thinking. And God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. We want to limit things to circumstances in our life. And God says, D don't you understand that I can change anything? I can move anything. I can take any circumstance and make it work for the good. What am I supposed to do? And, and, and listen, when I started the church, you, you, you see, here's, here's the other thing he had to do. See, I thought I knew what I was doing. And the first year in, I realized I didn't have a clue what I was doing. So what did I do? Did I go get another plan? No, I did what Jeremiah said. I sought him. I, I, I got face to face with him. And I allowed him to start changing some things. I started focusing on where he brought me from. I started focusing on why he prepared me for such a time as this. I started focusing on that he had already preordained this, that this was going to happen in this year, and it was going to move forward, and why it was going to move forward. All of a sudden, the focus is off of me, and the focus is on him. And when the focus came about, became about him and what he wanted, the doors started opening. See, we pray, Lord, open doors and close doors. But, 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 but really and truly, here's what we have to do. We have to be willing to walk through the doors he opens. And the enemy does not want you to achieve your purpose. But I'm telling you, the way God made us all and the way he created us all, the only way that his purpose can be accomplished on this earth, the kingdom of God, is for all of us to walk in our dreams and our purpose. Not one man, not just one pastor, not just a leader, but all of us. So through this whole series, 10 weeks, here's what I want. From a pastor's perspective, what I want is to see the sheep come into their purpose and be fulfilled and realize, wow, God really has a plan for my life. I'm not a mistake. I'm not a pipe dreamer. And I'm telling you, when you put your hands to knowing him and worshiping him, making him first, and your eyes are focused on where you've been and what, how he's protected you, then you trust him with total faith of where he's taking you. See, as long as I kept my hands on where I wanted to take the church, it wouldn't have been what God wanted. And listen, he's not where, we're, we're not where he wants us yet. But I can promise you this, I'm not standing up in the boat. I'm not buying a motor and put on the boat. And I'm not standing up in the boat and putting my hands on the controls. I'm going to row. I'm going to row. And I want you to go with me. I don't know what he has planned for us in the future. I just know it's big because God's big. I don't know how he wants us to affect people around the world. I just know that he can do it because he's God. And I want to be part of that. I want you part of that. I want your house part of that. I want your children part of that. I want your children to understand that they have a purpose and a destiny. I want you to speak and encourage over your children. I want it to be raised up that we're not just another citizen of a great country, but we're citizens of God's country. And our Father and our Creator has a plan and a purpose for us. And if you're breathing, it's not too late. It doesn't matter the age. It's just about the heart. Are you okay? I wonder how many dreams are sitting idle now in your heart because the enemy has you looking at the wrong side of circumstances and you've caved in to thinking I messed up. This is just the way it's supposed to be. No, it's not. You have to understand that your God can take all the messes we make and turn them around and make miracles out of them. That's because he's God. That's what he did with Joseph. And I promise you, whatever your gift is, the bottom line of your gift is to help people to help people. That's how you get the heart of God is to help people because that's what he wants to do. How's he going to help people? Through us. Through you. Through me. In every aspect. 
the arm and the hand and the foot and the leg. And all of us together makes the body that functions and moves and advances. And we see people saved and we see people healed and we see people delivered and set free. We see people minister to in the natural and then minister to in the spiritual. We see lives changed. All because we were able to go from our dream to our destiny. I want to pray for you. Father, thank you for loving us so much. And Holy Spirit, I don't know what you're saying to people listening to me. But I pray, Lord, that it's a push of faith as they realize a, a little nudge in their rowboat where they just need to put their hands back on the oar and believe your promises and your word and, and to put you first in their lives and give you thanks for where we've been and what, what, what we've accomplished and, what, and give you thanks for what you're going to do because truly what's coming is greater than what has been. And we want to be part of that as a church. We want to be part of that as an individual. We want to be part of what you're doing in our world because it'll be good. It'll help people. So bless your people today as they receive your word. Bless this series that it will interpenetrate and weave and plant together in our hearts your thoughts and your purpose for our lives. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And the church said amen. 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 God bless you.